Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm so delighted you could join us today. My intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all over the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. And boy, do I have a treat for you. We've got Julie Riesler with us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We were just laughing with each other before we started recording with, oh, I love your name. Love your name. What's your middle name? When were you born? We have all these things in common and we're both named for joyas. My Mima was my joya. Who was your joya that you were named? My after. great grandmother was there. Julia. You go. So yeah. see, almost the same. Maybe we're maybe we're Siamese twins separated at birth or something. Right. <laughs> but I think I'm way older than you are. But that's okay. I don't think so, Julie. <laughs> time, time isn't a thing in the spirit world, right? That's what they tell us. So we'll see. All right, everybody. Let me tell you about Julie. Julie, the other Julie. She is an interior designer for your soul. She's a mentor to hundreds of coaches change makers, and soulful entrepreneurs. She's the host of the USU podcast, a global show in over 175 countries, impressive, and author of Get a PhD in You, an Amazon top pick. I love that title, Get a PhD in You. Julie's been featured in Forbes and other publications, is a multi-time TEDx speaker, that's a big deal, and has spoken on stages throughout North America. She holds a master's degree in health and wellness coaching and is a professor at Georgetown University in their coaching program. That's a big deal too, girl. <laughs> Julie is the founder of the Life Designer Coach Academy, a leading edge program where she certifies life coaches from all over the world. So do you have any spare time with all of this going on? <laughs> Minimal. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. My my Mima, for whom I'm I'm named, as I just mentioned, she used to always say, I can sleep when I'm dead. Yeah. And and I kind of ascribe to that philosophy too. There's so much to do. There's so many fun things, so many interesting people, you being one of them, that uh I think we've got that in common too. So were you just born a leader? Did you come did you come out of the oven just as a leader? <laughs> Oh, I came out of the oven, I would say a lover, a lover and a bit of a people pleaser, Julie. And I, I think uh, my sister would probably say a little bossy at times, not, not as much now, but with her, I just, you know, I thought of her as my daughter, which is funny because uh, now I have a daughter. Um, I, I think I grew into this role through a lot of challenging dark nights of the soul moments, honestly. And those moments help me realize, well, what am I here for? And, you know, to me, it's like, um, what do they say? You know, God just qualifies those that are ready to just show up. I'm, I'm totally botching the quote, but to me, it's like, I'm here, put me in the game, however you want me to use me and let me just do some good things here in the world while I'm hopefully here for a long time. Is your sister younger than you? She is younger. And but how much? She's four years younger and she's awesome. She, we, we, uh, we've really, we've connected and, and become so much closer and she's, uh, she's a true creative. She's really a neat, she's just an amazing woman also. Well, that's old enough for you to act like you're her boss. My sister was, was 16 months younger than me. She's in heaven now. She died in 2010, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I used to boss her around too, but there wasn't enough of an age difference that it worked. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> you had enough age difference that you could get by with it. Yes. she. I remember going in her crib thinking like, oh, that's my baby. She's mine. I just assumed it was just the two of us. And it was enough, I was old enough where I really was like, oh, I'm her, I'm, I thought I was her mom. I mean, that was probably not the best way to come in at it, but I really, for, for a lot of time, really just saw her as like my little, my little baby. And so, you know, with that came telling her what to do. That's right. Well, I'm sure she turned out way better because you were doing that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So tell, tell us about your childhood. Did you grow up in a home that fostered independence and critical thinking and all of that. Tell us a little bit about how you grew up and where, and a little bit about your early life and journey. Yeah, gosh, it's a great, 
I love that question. I haven't, it's funny, I've been thinking a lot about just growing up. My parents are, you know, in early eighties and we've been having a lot of conversations. My husband just lost his mother, unfortunately. And I've been talking to them a lot about, you know, do you have your will? They're, they're not married anymore, but I grew up in Boston right outside of literally to like right next to the area with Harvard and MIT. So a lot of focus on, um, not from my parents, but from, you know, even in the public schools I went to in Newton were like, you know, being smart, intelligent, uh, really important, a lot of pressure and a lot of focus on being super, super smart. Um, I would say I am smart. Uh, my, my gifts are more in the realm of, I would say, emotional intelligence, connecting with people, with human beings, with the divine, that realm. Um, so I, you know, what I would say is this, my parents, super loving. Like I was very lucky. They uh, certainly gave me a ton of love and, and just um, in that way, I was very well fed. I think also, you know, some of the struggles, my dad was a Vietnam veteran who was undiagnosed with he had PTSD, bipolar, ADHD, a lot of issues um, from, I think probably not having the resources we do today. And so that just, that was challenging. I think for him and my mom, they were married until I was in my twenties and then they separated and divorced. Um, but I, you know, I was raised, um, loving, loving parents. My mom is a former opera singer and music. Oh, wow. Singer. Yep. So I was like in every drama play theater. I just grew up seeing, I mean, I could sing a musical tune and at the drop of a hat, like anything you want to know, <laughs> we've seen them all <laughs> been in many of them. She really, um, I think found her, 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 her service to the world through music. She's, uh, still volunteers from time to time. And so a lot of love and support, I think in terms of, you know, just growing up in a very affluent area. I mean, it's one of the most affluent areas in the world, in the country. And my, my parents struggling, um, you know, both financially, it, it made for an interesting kind of upbringing to be around that and that high intellectualism. Um, and just, you know, the, the Julia side of the family, my mom's side was really very supportive. They were very, uh, they were all entrepreneurs, all successful. And then on my dad's side, they were all like into farming. <laughs> so <laughs> very different family backgrounds. Um, and I was raised, you know, with a lot of appreciation for love. And, you know, my mom would have people at the dinner table who were priests and ministers and imams and rabbis and just all different kinds of, of people of prayer who would come together to sing for various holidays and traditions. So I was really raised by this, this real sense of oneness. Um, very lucky for that. Um, and, and, you know, just really a lot of those lessons around being smart have been something that I've, that I've done a lot of healing work around. So that's probably that's probably a good place to start. I mean, I, I loved school. I I'm very grateful. I grew up in a, in a beautiful, I mean, I love new England. I kind of miss it sometimes. Um, and lots of just lots of blessings and of course, you know, struggles as well. I am very open about struggling with food addiction, sugar addiction. Um, it didn't translate into alcohol, but I just kind of don't go there since it's uh, it's in the same family, you know, sugar and alcohol. So learned a lot about myself through um, not loving myself originally and coming back to how do I really love who I am and who I'm not? Well, all my listeners know that I'm a, I'm a recovering sugar addict myself. And as mm -hmm. of April 1st of this year, I'll be sugar sober for four years. And I always say that that alcohol is a sugar IV. It's the same thing. It's just, it doesn't have to digest. And so yeah, I got sugar sober at 59 when I finally just said, I can't control this. This is nuts. And it gave me insights as it sounds like it has you as well, Julie, into understanding what addiction feels like. And people go, oh, well, it's just sugar. It's an addiction just like cocaine, just like alcohol, just like any of the other addictions. Wouldn't you agree? Oh my gosh. Yes. And I'm actually like, wow, how we are so connected. Look at that. I mean, that's, that's not every day I hear someone say that. No, it, it, it um, is a hundred percent, you know, addictive. And I, they've done so many studies that sugar can be 
as challenging, if not more to, to get off of like the, it, it's so prevalent and it's so packed into so many foods and things that it doesn't need to be. Um, so for me also, like, I just, I just don't, I don't do it. I just don't do it because it's not loving to my body. It's not even a, it's not a weight thing. It's not, a, it's just not, it's not good for my my being for, for my physical, uh, my sacred temple doesn't work. And I, I think that's amazing about being sugar sober. I love, I haven't heard it said that way. Um, for me that, that abstinence, I don't love that word. I think of it more as like loving limits, you know, just loving guidelines and listening. Um, that's, changed my life. I did a lot of, um, for me, I did some recovery and program work, uh, with 12 steps and other programs that really helped me about 20 years ago and made huge difference in, in everything. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of clients and I think a huge percentage of women throughout the world, especially in America, have a sugar addiction issue. I talk to multiple women a week that have a sugar addiction thing going on. And now if there's sugar in something that I'm not aware of, I have a bite or two and my heart starts racing. It feels like it's going to jump out of my chest. So I know not to eat any more of it because I've been off of it long enough that my body's going, what the heck are you doing? You know, this, this is not good. So interesting connection. We keep coming up with all these connections, you guys that Julie and I have. So how did your leadership abilities develop? Were you on student council in school? Were you like head of the theater department? What did you do? And then how has it ramped up to the point where you're teaching at Georgetown for God's sakes, for people (laughs) to how to be leaders? And for those of you that are listening abroad, Georgetown's one of the top universities in the US. It's a big deal. Yeah. You know, I kind of always have had this inner like passion spark to just do things, to help others, to be of service, to make an impact and, and, and to do what I love. And so I, I also, as I said, I was groomed in a, in a, you know, in a school system and in a community where there were a lot of activists and people that were into leadership positions. So, you know, I was in, I remember being into journalism and I was there, um, I would write articles every week and I would announce them on the the loudspeaker. And I was there like their speaker, their journalist, uh, what do you call it? A broadcast manager. And I loved that. I, I always say I'm kind of I ha- multi-passionate is the way I would describe myself. So, you know, I was in a women's acapella group and I would perform And I just, I really gravitated towards some of these areas that I felt like, you know, it's all about self-expression when you really look at it. Um, And so for me, getting involved in journalism, in theater arts and performing and singing. And I remember I started a psychology club, you know, in high school because I was struggling and I didn't know it at the time. I was really struggling with food and sugar and was like, how do we help each other? I can't do this myself. So I was like, there's got to be, I didn't even realize I did end up, um, that was my major with psychology. And, um, and so I think for me, it came out of the both of what I loved and what did I want to, how did I want to self-express? And so that was, that was like a natural expression for me. Um, I mean, I certainly sports, I was okay. Like I, 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 you know, had a father that wanted two sons. So I played soccer. I was decent. I was not, I wouldn't say I was the leader of that team. I, I was always worried about hurting people, which is not, you cannot play a sport well if you're worried about hurting people or getting hurt. So my thing was definitely more dancing and, and kind of those individual <laughs> activities like that. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting when I look back, I, when I really started to get clear about addiction and how it was affecting me. And that started to, um, you know, when you put down the addiction, all of the other things come up to the surface. And as I started, and I'm remembering this actually in 2003, when I started to do some real in deep work on myself, it was Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, who I just love her. I love that book. And it helped me really get okay, if I'm going to be doing, having leadership roles, like what's, where, where do I want to make an impact? Where do I want to make a difference? And um, there is a lot more I could say there, but I actually remember I I got myself back into, I I used to do a lot of on-camera work, uh, hosting and commercials and real people modeling, like where you go and, you know, I was in a commercial for like um, 
what is it called? Oh my gosh, urinary issues. It was so funny. I was like, next time, can you please put me in a car commercial, not a bladder commercial? <laughs> so it's just that type of expression. I loved it. Um, and then I realized I don't want to just act and play a part. I really want to do this in a way where I'm making an impact. And I think that's a lot to do with the work I've done with speaking, podcasting, this kind of thing. Um, for me, it's always been following. I really believe when we follow our heart, we follow what lights us up, the energy, um, when it feels good and aligned. And, it, it, you know, to me, that's like, it feels good and it doesn't harm other people. Like it's for the highest good of me and others. And that's always my offering, my prayer show me what is for my highest good and anybody I'm here to serve or work with or connect with or collaborate with like you, like it's gotta be a win, win, win. Otherwise I don't really want to be part of it. That's, that's not what I'm here to do. So it's kind of been following these, these little breadcrumbs. And sometimes it looked like a back alley or a dangerous neighborhood. And, you know, thankfully, thankfully got through those and have used those experiences for greater strength, you know, and, um, and trust and faith. What's mindfulness? Mindfulness, great question. So, you know, I'm like, okay, there's like the John Kabat-Zinn definition, which I remember when I did my my graduate program, we learned, I did a whole mind-body science mindfulness class. Uh, it was, I had to write a dissertation on it. You know, what he says is that mindfulness is really being here in the moment, paying attention without judgment, like being present, being here, right, right here, right now. Um, I love that definition. I would add to it. And this is something that I've been practicing and I am always practicing. It's being here in the moment. So it's being here now. It's being in this, in this present second, the second, the second being here now without bringing the past into the present and the future. And that, and being aware, right? And I think of it as having eyes that are not just in the front of your face, but are all, you know, in the back of your head that are, you know, it's tuning into what you can see and you can't see. It's tuning into the five senses and your sixth sense and the other senses. So to me, mindfulness is like a, uh, a, a, a turbo presence, a type of presence that's not just listening, not just quiet, not just in the moment, but is really here for the possibility, the potentiality of something completely new. And that takes practice to not bring the past into the present, to really be here brand new. It's kind of like, if you really look at it, it's like being reborn. Mindfulness could be thought of as, and we're in the springtime, being reborn, 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 coming back, coming back to, you know, that, that being new again, renewal. Uh, that's how I would define it. Interesting. And you have a, an app called the Insight Timer. So can that help somebody who's a beginner who has no clue what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Say mindfulness and okay, leave the past out, but just be in the present. Well, how do you do that? Yeah. How, how would you teach somebody who's brand new and does your app come into play in that situation? Yes. So Insight Timer, not, not my app, but it's a, it's a global app with 16 million users. I am a course creator, teacher. I have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of meditations up there. I personally have found meditation and guided meditation to be very powerful and helpful, especially when you're getting started. And I'm, what I'm saying sounds like, what the heck is she talking about? It's really what we're talking about is coming back to the present, breathing with intention, being here right now. And often it's hard to do that. So I think guided is a phenomenal way to go. I have a ton of meditations. There are other teachers up there as well. There's a lot to choose from. You basically go through it and say, okay, am I dealing with stress? Am I dealing with, you know, maybe needing clarity, relationships, whatever area, maybe you want to sleep better. Um, there you will find something there. And I, I certainly have courses and I have meditations that really are geared towards helping you to come back to right now and appreciate it and to feel it. We don't want to just be in it. We want to feel the, you know, the gift of, of being present is, is calm. And it's, it's, it's that sense of, you know, feeling at ease and tapped in and tuned in and like, you're not alone and you have guidance and you have grounding and, you know, rather than feeling frazzled, you feel 
rooted. So I know, you know, meditation, it changes your brain. It changes the gray matter in your brain. There's so much research on that um, and certainly can help with, with that sense of mindfulness. Can you speak to that for a minute about how meditation does change the neurological pathways and what does it do in the brain from a medical standpoint, let's say, and then how does that translate into somebody having a life that maybe is more fulfilling, more enjoyable? So for many of us, we live in a very fast paced digital society. Most people, I think, listening, I would imagine, right? We're tethered to our phones, you know, our phones, which rob us of our attention. They're also great. I'm holding it up right now. Just demonstrate phone in case you, <laughs> just in case you need a little reminder. Um, you know, in addition, there's other things about uh, computers, TVs, phones, not just the electromagnetic waves that are going on, the blue light, but it's also a distraction oftentimes. Like, so, you know, addiction can be around media around social media, around, you know, numbing yourself out by going down these rabbit holes of (laughs) I've been there right on Instagram. And you're like, Oh, I'm just now two hours in what's happening. What happens is when we do that, we are training our brain to not necessarily be in the present moment. We are, you know, comparing, we're looking at other people. We're thinking about the past. We're thinking about our future. We're not really here now. And so what happens is what we do know, and this is very basic, the whole concept of neuroplasticity is really the idea that, you know, we have billions of neurons, right? Of of neurons in our brain. We have neurons in our gut. We have uh, sensory neurons in our heart, yet our brain is, you know, where we have, of course, our thoughts and our beliefs and the stories. And if, you know, so you have neurons that are constantly firing, So what fires together, wires together, meaning if you are constantly, um, let's say you're, you go down the rabbit hole, you're into social media, two hours a day, you're watching two hours of TV, no judgment. There's not a whole lot of presence in there, right? So what's happening is you're constantly firing those neurons and they're creating grooves, paths that then create the wiring. And so what happens is that feels normal. If you're not doing that, that's going to feel abnormal to your brain because we literally memorize those patterns. That's why it takes at least 90 to 120 days to change a pattern is what you're doing is when you start doing something new, like going to the gym, right? And starting to use weights again, let's say you took a little hiatus, many of us during the last couple of years, right? You're getting back into using your weights. It takes a little time to condition. It literally takes time for your brain to have that conditioning as well, to have that new wiring. So that's a whole other conversation, how to, how to really the motivational piece, um, but neurologically. So to have that new wiring, you got to do something new. Otherwise you're going to have what fires together, wires together. That's the concept of neuroplasticity. What we used to think and believe scientists used to think this is in the fifties and before is that you can't change your habits. And it's not true. You can. So mindfulness is just you can change, you can learn to become present. Um, Even meditating as much as five minutes, 10 minutes, if you're not into sitting still, even doing an outside walk, maybe it's putting on nature sounds or listening to nature and just noticing there's a technique called the see, hear, feel, right? I, I see a blue jay, I hear the crickets, I feel the wind on my body and you keep rotating through see, hear, feel. Do that for five minutes. You do that every single day, you will start rewiring your brain. The other piece that's important to talk about is our stress response. When we are overwhelmed and we're stressed, There's a literal uh, effect that happens in our body and it's called the HPA axis. What happens is your hypothalamus, your pituitary and your adrenals, your hypothalamus triggers your pituitary, which triggers your adrenals when you're in fight or flight, when you are stressed out. Then what happens is we all know this, you start feeling more adrenaline. You are emitting more adrenaline, more cortisol. Over time, if you're doing this, For non-threatening situations, but it becomes a learned behavior, you're really going to start taxing your nervous system. And what can happen is it can affect your sleep. It can it can cause a hostile environment in your body, um, and it can affect every it can affect everything. Um, And that's something I have done with a lot of work around, a lot of healing around. And many of us are do are walking around with taxed nervous systems without realizing that. Um, 
So I think that that's the, you know, the only other thing I would say is in our brain, the emotional center where, you know, we know the amygdala, for example, is where you feel anger and upset and emotions. And if you're in a constant state of panic, of overwhelm, of frustration, of resentment, again, it, it's like a learned pattern. And so what you want to do is just notice, like I would say, take a daily inventory, take one day and just notice when you wake up, are you feeling calm? Are you feeling anxious? Notice how you feel right after breakfast, after your first meeting, notice before you go to bed, what are you saying to yourself? All of this is going to give you some data. And it's important if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling like you're not in the moment and present, many of us are suffering from that. The good news is it can change. And it's really important to do something about it because it can affect your health. It can affect your, your mental, your emotional, your physical health. It really can. Um, and there's lots of tools and ways to heal uh, and, to, and to heal that parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest. Otherwise, um, you know, we can end up in this over exertion and, and constantly emitting cortisol and adrenaline and, and, and hormones that are not great for our body to be in in long-term states. Right. Causes inflammation and long-term inflammation causes disease and illness. And then the other thing about it too, is we lose our sense of clarity when that happens, because you're running away from that email that's upsetting and not the saber tooth tiger that we're hardwired to run away from, but the body doesn't know any differently. So I completely agree with you. I've read a lot of articles that say, turn off all the electronics for two hours before you go to bed. I don't know anybody that does that just in our normal world where we're so wired, but I do think that it makes sense. And I used to see it when my son was little, my son, Jonathan, and this was way before we knew any of this and way before the internet, you know, and all of that kind of thing. But I would notice if he watched TV for more than like maybe an hour a day, his behavior would change. And I thought, okay, there's something going on with this. Plus, I think little children are very attracted to certain kinds of stimuli as well. And I I know lots of toddlers that can't speak in a complete sentence yet, but they sure know how to use an iPhone and an iPad. Yes. What it, What's your thought on that? I think they just come in more advanced each generation, but do you have a thought on that? I do. And actually, I want to say one other thing that you just sparked a memory or, th- or a thought, and it's really an important one. And you said, and I agree with this, when we're constantly in that place of, you know, we're, we're, we're tethered, right, to our devices, we're missing messages, we're missing guidance. And that is something, and I know you are into this as well, I have noticed it firsthand, the shift in connecting to my intuition, to your inner guidance um, has skyrocketed as I have practiced being present and being able to tune in and listen. And I really believe that our intuition is our, it's a birthright. It's a superpower. It's a gift. It's for everybody. And it, I mean, I I could go on and on about the times that it is literally, you know, I hear it, I see it, I feel it. It is literally said, Julie, do this, move here, do, you know, don't go this route. Um, And I've had a couple different times in my life where, because I was able to hear that, and listen and follow it, it changed and saved my life. I also can see when I did not pay attention because I was not tuned in. Um, And there are some, you know, repercussions, not not to judge any myself or for us to judge ourselves, but I can see it clear as day. So that's a huge benefit is being able to access your guidance. And I really, I, to me, that's like, gosh, I just, I know you teach this as well. Something I, I want all of us to be able to do because it's, it's a gift and and it's for everybody. We're here, we're born with that. So yes, I, and I, I, back to your question, I, I just think each generation of babies of children, I see this with my kids and, and their cohort, you know, my kids are in the, is 15, 15 today, actually. And my son, is, my daughter's 16, you know, I'm seeing it, these, these children that are so tapped in and so connected and also sensitive 
more sensitive um, and probably more to be sensitive around. I mean, I didn't, growing up, we didn't have phones. We barely had computers and they were like the big clunky, huge IBM. I mean, it was humongo. I remember we had one with like green and black. That was it. Like the color was like green writing. I mean, it was old school. Um, I didn't have as much of a distraction, but you know, in some ways it's wonderful because we have a lot of technological advances and and ways like, you know, I had my kids playing mind games and fun video things that were educational. And um, God, what was the class, the, the TV show? I think it's like something magic bus. And, and she teaches all about these great principles in the universe and in life and in, you know, math and science. And my kids loved it. So there's some really good resources. It's just, it's like anything. Are you, you know, is it becoming an addiction? Is it, is it, becoming something that is, um, out of the realm of moderation. And I, and I just think one of the areas we need to look at for ourselves is what really is moderate, what is in the realm of healthy and, you know, normal, normal is not the greatest word, but, you know, when you start to feel like you're craving, you can't do without it. I mean, that, that has addiction written all over it. So I think addiction is found in many forms. And this is one that is, this is a tough one. It's a tough one because it's so alluring, especially for little kids. Mm-hmm. Oh, any age kid. Yeah. Age. I have yeah. I have teenage grandsons through marriage and oh my gosh, they're just so plugged in on all of that. And I laugh because one of the middle one, Max Ryan, named after the wicked step grandmother, I thought that was a, a score, don't you think? Awesome. Um, he, Ryan's his middle name, he uh, was saying that they were making him memorize the periodic table. And I thought, why? You can pull it up in a nanosecond online. Why do you have to memorize it? That's just so old thinking. So I think there's a balance between the two and to utilize the resources that we have to really help. And at the same time, don't just stay in your little QB tapped into your computer all day. You know, you've got to be able to communicate with people one-on-one. To your point about not being able to hear guidance, I always say spirit doesn't communicate on the I feel crappy channels because the vibration's too low. And spirit's vibration's very high because it doesn't have a body that's dense to slow down that vibration. I use analogies a lot to describe all this woo-woo stuff that I do. And I say, imagine trying to run an electrical current through a bowl of pudding. (laughs) It's going to slow it down just because of the mass of the pudding. And to your point earlier to Julie about the neural pathways in the brain, I see them when I scan somebody, I'm like a human MRI. And when I'm scanning somebody medically, with their permission, of course, I don't do it without, but I see these neural pathways and they look like laser beams as part of a security system that crisscross a room, like in a museum or a home or an office building. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen a a movie where somebody's trying to steal something and they're stepping over the laser beams and rolling under them. And sometimes I'll see those pathways look like they have a short in them and they look like they've been charred similar to what an electrical wire can look like to an electrician. So it's really interesting and and corroborates everything that you just said. When I'm scanning somebody energetically, I see that step too. You talk about that you built your life around others' expectations of you. Can you share a little bit about, was there a catalyst? Was there an event that just kind of really got your attention and smacked you upside the head and said, whoa, this is something that I need to address. And then talk about how you addressed it and where you are now with that. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a couple, there's a, there's a couple, I'll, I'll, I'll say the two that were the most, uh, that stand out as pretty, pretty, uh, wake up call ish, <laughs> like a transformative. Um, and you know, and I alluded to it for me, I I just, I am a high, high empath. I think I'm sure others listening are going to relate to this. I have always been highly in tune, uh, sensitive. I think part of it was having a father with PTSD that was undiagnosed. He was very, very, very loving to me, very unloving to himself. And I could read his thoughts. And I didn't know I could do this. And that might sound strange, although not in this community. I don't think so. I literally could read 
like it was like a book almost what he was feeling. And so I could hear um, that he wanted to take his life. I knew this. And he has since uh, shared with me that that was true. Um, and I could hear this early on. I could hear, I was very in tune with him, uh, my mom too, and others, but I was like super tuned in. And I knew that my doing well in school and life was, was his greatest joy. Uh, he put a lot of energy and pride, I think, into me and me being happy and doing well. So, you know, that sensitivity, that empath abilities, the intuitive abilities, great, yet at the same time, it, it breeded a Petri dish of, of really just doing what I thought I needed to make sure other people were okay and happy. Also called codependence um, to the extreme. I didn't know I was doing that. I mean, I got a lot of positive feedback, a lot of love and appreciation and, um, and you know, at loving my dad like nothing else. I wanted to, I literally, I think intuitively wanted to keep him alive. And so I became exceptional at reading people and their energy and what they're saying and what they're not saying and how to make sure I am doing whatever I can to, you know, make sure they're happy and okay. And that, that, that started that, that whole pattern, I think for me, and I've read, done a lot of reading and a lot of studying around food and, and, and how as an addiction, it, it can also shut down emotions and intuition because you're blocking yourself. Like the pudding now becomes like glue, right? Like now, um, whatever intuition I'm getting is now shut down. I didn't want to have that. And I didn't know how to handle the emotions around feeling not good enough. I, as I said, I grew up in a very, very, um, competitive, especially, uh, intellectually and in that way. So I shut down through self-loathing and self-abuse with food and sugar, um, I also had these sensitivities that I did not know what to do with. And so, you know, and I can see how I went into psychology, right? Like, okay, well, I'm going to help people. So for me, the way this showed up, I got married pretty young to a really good person, like really good person, great family. Um, we are not married today as part of my story, um, but we were married and together 15 years. And at the time we had not had kids yet. Um, I was in a job I liked, but I didn't love. And I was, I was, I could not stop eating. I mean, I just could not stop eating sugar. I remember M&Ms are kind of my arch nemesis. I could not stop eating these tie-dyed M&Ms from Costco that were like limited edition. I was just shoveling like cups down. And I um, had worked with a therapist who I was, I was painting her house and she would like kind of ca counsel me on the side and had told me about the support group. So I was going to go to a meeting and I remember I was in my car and as I was on my way, I just, the thought came up, you know, maybe I should just drive into a tree. Maybe I should just like literally end this now because I can't handle this. Um, I, I can't handle the pressure to be loved and liked and be what everyone needs. And I can't handle the pressure of, I can't stop. And I think, you know what that means? Like I could not stop eating and using sugar and it was awful. Um, and so I, really, really considered with one hand in the bag. Uh, I remember this. It was, I live outside of Washington, DC. I was going to this church that had a meeting, a recovery meeting. And I was like, I'm going to go into the tree. And then I heard my higher guidance just say, go to the meeting. Just if you go to this meeting, your whole life will change. I promise you. I promise you. And I was bawling. And I just thought, well, I might as well like see and, and just try it. And it did change. It changed everything. And I started to learn how to love myself and excavate who I really am. What I call, you know, being your you is you, my me is me. That came from, you know, this process. Uh, for me, it started in the 12 steps, but then I also did other kinds of uh, personal work. And in discovering and excavating myself, I had another experience, um, about 10 years later, I woke up in the middle of the night and I just heard, you know, I had two young kids. I was married at the time and I woke up three, three, three on the clock, not a fun time to wake up with a, what I thought was a heart attack. It was a pan attack. And it just said, you're, you're not okay. Like you're not okay. And you're not honoring yourself. You're not okay here. Um, and I had to really look at that. And that was, that was a definite wake up call. The rest since then have been less intense like that because I really made a decision to start listening and honoring that inner guidance. Um, 
And all I can tell you is that's 12 years ago. Uh, so much has shifted because I decided, I said, yes, I'm going to be listening to that and follow that and trust that. And it's not always easy. It's what brought me to my master's degree. It's what had me decide to leave a day job when I had two kids and I was a single mom. Um, it's helped me to really strengthen my relationship with myself, my higher guidance and self, my, you know, I think of the, uh, there's spirit. And then there's all these helpers that are here in non-physical and, it's been quite amazing. I, I will just say I keep a list, an evidence list, and it's so huge of what has happened. And I'm like, oh, we're not alone here. There is love and higher guidance for anybody at any time, no matter what you call it, what religion you are, it is for everybody. And um, it's just, it's one of the things I really stand for is um, honoring your gifts, yourself, Um I don't know if that answers the question. So I went off in a different direction, but. No, no, it does. And I give you a lot of credit for having the courage to yeah. step outside of your life that you had created because you thought that's what you were supposed to do and had the, I call it golden ovary courage. You know, guys have breast balls, girls have golden ovaries and it's the golden ovary courage to step out of your comfort zone and go to where you were being led. And obviously this is where you were being led to this journey that you're on now. And I relate to that too. I'm a businesswoman and an inventor who now does woo woo. And I thought, oh my God, people are going to think I'm nuts. And so it does take courage. I've been there uh, many times. And, and I think we get stuck in that what if, and if we can just take one little step, I would say, think of yourself as Dorothy on the yellow brick road, just step on one brick, see where it leads. Mm -hmm. You may end up in a field of blooming poppies and take a nap, or you may end up in a wicked witch's castle being chased by flying monkeys. And, and then you're led to see, oh gosh, there's a pail of water over here. And then you're led to throw it on the witch and she melts. Well, so it's all part of our journey and it's all good, even in the moment when it feels awful. So I love the see, hear, feel, you know, I'm in the castle. I'm seeing these flying monkeys. I'm hearing, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then I feel, okay, look at that corner. And you feel this pail of water that you throw on the wicked witch. So is there something in particular that you have that's like a little hack that you use when you feel yourself getting into that place where you can really get yourself back into the present quickly? Yeah, I I have a I have a I have like a little toolbox of a couple of different things. I'll, I'll just share maybe two that I use. Um I personally look, I think there's one aspect is we are physical beings, right? Having a, you know, we're spiritual beings having a physical experience, but we are physical. And so for me, often that like, I need something that's embodied that I can feel. So I, I've also done a lot of work with the HeartMath Institute, HeartMath and Heart Intelligence. I really, really resonate uh, and seem to really do well when I'm like, oh yeah, I'm spitting out, I'm overwhelmed, I'm people, whatever's going on. And it's like, hand, hands on my heart. Just first of all, feel my heart beating be in the moment. Uh, this is incredible. Like your heart, you know, even just reflecting, shoot, my heart has been beating. Your heart's been beating before you were even out of the, you know, out of born into this world. Cause you it beats while you're in utero. So just connecting like, Oh my God, what a gift. Like she's beating all times. Um, and then I like to just kind of tune in a little, like what's happening? What do I need? So that, you know, if I, if I forget all of that, a hand on my heart, that is just, I often go to bed and I wake up that way. I really like that um, kind of grounding that physical piece to it. Um, the other, another one is, is really, and we know this because of the research around breathing. I just finished a fantastic book about this. I studied this in my program. Dr. Andrew Weil has the four, seven, eight combination. I mean, you could, if you, if you're doing five or six, you know, seconds, inhale and exhale, then you're, you're in that range. You really want to inhale. So four, you hold it for seven and you exhale for eight, um, literally tampers your stress response. So I am doing a lot. I, all the time, my kids are fighting and I'm like, 
okay, Julie, nose, nasal breathing um, in and then hold it and then out twice as long. So that is another one that I, that I love to do. The third, I would say, you know, I am big into um, looking for a spiritual solution to whatever is going on. So I personally, with anything, I like the whole posture of, you know, hands up and open, it's surrender, it's receptive receptivity. And I will just do that. Not when I'm driving, obviously I'm not going to put my hands open. So I don't do it. I do it in my mind's eye, but I just say, you know, spirit universe, like God, please you take this and you guide me. Let me do your will, make it clear. Give me signs, like have fun with me. I don't really care. Just I'm, I'm, I'm challenged right now. I'm, I'm in a very human spot. I could use some higher guidance. And I, that is my dominant way of handling anything. Um, my business, I, I, every day I'm reminding myself, you know, Hey God, you're my employer. So whoever I'm supposed to serve or work with, like go bring them in. And if not, then great. It's really helped me. Um, I just find that I do the best when I'm connected and, you know, it's like, plugged into the wall, right? If you, you probably heard this, you try to vacuum and you don't plug it in, you're not going to get much done. So we got to, I think of it as we got to plug ourselves in. And I try to plug myself back in the wall as often as humanly possible. Cause sometimes I knock out the cord somehow. Um, and I just want to be plugged into that energy that is ever flowing. That is in everything that is part of our design, our divine design. Exactly. And you're listening to your inner guidance, which is spirit communicating through you. And I believe we're all part of the same energy source. We're just little fractiles getting quantum physics here on you, but it's all source. It's all God. It's all the universe, whatever you want to call it. I do the four, seven, eight breathing. Again, what Julie said, in for four, hold for seven, breathe out for eight. I do it every night when I get in bed and I count my fingers. You know, I'll do eight of them and I'll count it on my fingers. And then I follow that with, again, on my fingers, I'm grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for my son. I'm grateful for my daughter-in-law. I'm grateful. And I and I have something that I'm grateful for. Usually my left hand is the same every night. And then my right hand is stuff that has happened through the day. And it's part of my nightly kind of prayer meditation thing that helps us, helps me, helps us, me, myself, and I, <laughs> helps me get uh, to a place where I'm able to fall asleep and I sleep great. But it, to your point, it calms down that nervous system that we're so busy. And as women, we all know, you know, when you were married, my my husband does this too. I think pretty much all of them do. They say, okay, let's go to bed. Well, they go to bed and then I got 10 other things I got to do. Yes. I got to oh. make sure the, you know, the doors are locked and I got to be sure that the dishwasher started and the blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Let the dog out, that kind of thing. And that's just a female versus a male thing. And he laughs, he, my husband, Timmy goes, well, you could just go to bed too. Right. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, my then, I love you that. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, I, I'm re, I've been remarried for a while now. And I, and I, I mean, I remember this before, but with my husband, I mean, we just, he's like, what he will say is, oh gosh, Julie, you are revving up. Cause I get excited. I'll talk about some topic and that fiery, I'm a fire sign through and through. And it's like, shoot. And he's like, I hear it in your voice. I, and then he's out, he's done. And I'm like, shoot. Now I'm like circulating the thoughts. So we, I put my little iPad, you know, the, uh, what do they call those? sleeping patches on so that I don't see anything anymore. And we, I'm just like, all right, enough stop because otherwise, and I do the four, seven, eight also, I have to, I have to. Yeah. To calm down. (laughs) Yes. How important has it been for you in this journey to properly nourish and rest? And you've talked about staying away from sugar and I totally relate to that, but is there kind of a system that you've devised for yourself that's working well? And how did you come up with that system? Yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, I I didn't add soon after I exited right stage right of my marriage, which was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I um, 
was diagnosed with a thyroid condition um, called Hashimoto's. And, you know, today I see it as an, as, as a, as a gift in disguise because interestingly, I was studying in addition to my master's degree, I was also doing kind of a minor in integrative uh, fun, functional nutrition and health. And so I, I learned, thank goodness, right away, this is about 10 years ago, right away um, that being calm, that having mindfulness practices, that moving every day, the foods you eat, the kinds of foods you eat, we know this, um, they really are important. So for me, the first three hours of my day, um, sometimes it's taking my kids to school and it's in there, but it's, you know, meditation practice, journaling, prayer, um, and exercise. No question. I do use supplements. I, do a lot of, one of my favorite things to do is a tonic that has ginger and lemon um, and apple cider vinegar. I, you know, decided to, in addition to take out sugar, I follow an autoimmune protocol, which is really just no dairy, no gluten, no soy, no sugar. Um, so it sounds <laughs> like no nothing, but I'll tell you, I when I realized this was happening, I'm like, okay, I can look at it like there's not a lot to eat or I can get a really fun purple pen and circle everything that I can eat. And, and there's, there's tons in there that I can. So it, it's also not overdoing it with work. I have a tendency, I have an addictive personality. I love what I'm doing. I've seen this where, you know, I would work until two in the morning if I could, I love it. And it's never ending. I'm sure you know, this as a entrepreneur and inventor. And it's like, you know, kind of my candy store. I love this work. I, I could do things at all times. I'm writing a book again. Like I've just put it on hold for a little bit, Julie. Cause I'm like, no calm moderation, having a balance, um, ending work, you know, at a reasonable hour, having time to read, to take a bath, to breathe, to talk to friends. I don't be with my husband. Like these are crucial things that I've realized it's all part of it. So for me, it's, it's the energy. How am I, you know, being in my day? What's my intention? How am I, am I rushing through my meals? I tend to eat fast. I'm training myself right now to be a slow eater. It's my goal in life is, to, and I'm getting there. Um, it's just, my instinct is like, quick, 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 finish, finish, finish. You got to do this. And that, that energy that's the energy that takes us out of the present. So sure, the way that I eat, the things, the supplements, you know, I have a lot of team, people on my team that help me to be as healthy as I can be. Um, I'm in the beginning of, I'll just, I'm very open, open book. I'm in the beginning of perimenopause, which is super interesting. And I guessing you've probably have, ex maybe have experienced that and probably others as well. So getting rest and, and really like, taking exquisite care of myself. That is my most important job. Um, absolutely hands down. And I finally, I'm finally doing that and believe that and, and know that for me. And I know that it's so crucial. Um, yeah. So that's what it looks like. What happens when you feel like you're being pulled to sugar at this point? What do you, what's the message that you tell yourself? Well, First of all, above all, my most important thing is to not judge and to be loving to myself. That is the most important thing. So the few times, I mean, it has not been perfect. It has not been perfect, but I would say, you know, probably 98% of the time I don't eat sugar. Sometimes there are sugar and things I didn't realize. Um, interestingly, most about a year ago, I realized, oh, you know what I'm started doing? I have transferred this to stevia. <laughs> Look at that. Now I'm addictively eating stevia. That's been a challenge for me, Julie. I'll be honest, because that addiction, like, oh, I'm feeling tired. I just want to feel comforted. Well, look, sugar, the thing is, it, it affects, it gives us dopamine, right? We get a hit. There's a real hormonal neurochemical effect. So, you know, if I pick something that is stevia today. It's usually that. Um, I just try to be loving to myself. I put my hand on my heart and I'm like, Julie, what do you need? What do you really need right now? And usually it's like a nap. <laughs> um, I need to call a phone friend. I need to, I'll make tea. I'll, you know, there's the things I can do, like making tea, journaling, calling a friend, distracting myself, but often underneath it is, you've probably heard of this, the, the hungry, the halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. There's usually one of those things that's going on. So I'm more curious with loving curiosity. What do I need? How can I love myself? That has been 
a miraculous shift for someone like myself. I did not do that 20 years ago, not even close. I see. I still look at the dessert menu. If I'm someplace that has like a bakery counter, I'm I'm in front of it going, oh my God, look at this. Oh, this looks amazing. And then I say, yeah, I don't eat that anymore. And I keep walking. So that's the thing that I say to myself. But to your point about the stevia, I found myself thinking about this keto granola that I found. It was grain-free. It was all this other stuff free. It was monk fruit and erythritol sweetened. And I found myself craving it and I wanted to eat it all the time. And I thought, all right, this is triggering that addiction thing in my head, even though it's not sugar, it's sweet. And my brain is taking it the same way. Now, different from a piece of fruit, certainly, but it's taken it the same way. So I've just stopped buying it. I don't have it in my house anymore because I just thought, okay, I'm going down this slippery slope and I'm not going there. And I was able to nip it in the bud, but boy, it was really good when I was yeah, eating it. It was so good. Uh, Can yeah. I have one quick funny thing? Because you reminded me with it, looking at the at the shops that uh, I don't watch a lot of TV, but what I have found is I love things where people are creative. And I laugh at myself because, laugh with myself, I have found these shows that are all these lovely cooking challenges and dessert challenges. And they're so, for example, the great, uh, the British baking show, right? It's just so- With fun. Mary, with yes. Mary, Mary yeah. Berry. I love it's, Mary Berry. It's so fun. It's so creative. I My husband watches watch me sometimes and I'm like, I don't need any of this. There's not one thing here I would eat or can eat or that works for me. It is just so- delightful though. And so I found that that it can be really a fun way to kind of feel like I'm still just, you know, getting some sort of, uh, appreciation. Yeah, exactly. Well, if somebody who's listening is feeling stuck, what would be the first step that you would suggest for them to do just in closing? Let's, let's leave that little tidbit. Yeah, what would be I, the first thing you would suggest to them to just move on from where they're where they're where the quicksand is that they're stuck in. The first thing is actually the most important thing is if you realize you're stuck and you're aware of it, it's like in anything, you got to first have that awareness. So number one, commend yourself. Like, okay, I think of it like this. Think of yourself putting a white flag up, which means like I surrender, I'm stuck. Right. So you want to first acknowledge it. You really want to acknowledge yourself compassionately. When we start judging ourselves, we we shift our energy and become, you know, an inner frequency. So you want to lovingly, compassionately say, OK, I'm stuck. Um, the, the next thing to do would be to, to look at it to look like under the rock and, you know, to do a little bit of journaling, like what's going on, where, you know, so there's a lot more I could say, but to keep it simple, you know, writing down, where am I stuck? What's the belief around being stuck? There's a belief there. There always is. There's always a little, like the tooth that needs to be pulled when your kids are younger and it's like hanging on a thread. There's a belief that's hanging there that you got to look at. This probably, it's not true, but it feels true. Um, This is where I, this is why I got into coaching. I always have a coach. I teach coaches. I teach at Georgetown, my own program. I highly recommend finding somebody, a coach. It it can be a coach or a mentor or somebody who can help you to really dig into that belief and dig into what's happening and to help you see it from different angles so that you can start to pull it out of where it's stuck into and start to decide how you want to be and how you want to see it. But first, the first step is you got to see it. So if you do see it, that's, that's great. Um, that, that means you're ready to make a change because you have that awareness. The, the whole thing around readiness to change, there's a whole um, theory called the stages of change. If you don't see it, you can't, you don't have readiness for change. So to see it, we, we got to celebrate that. It's a big deal. Um, and then if you're ready, then you start looking at what's happening underneath it. Yeah. Great advice. How can people learn more about you? How can they get in touch with you? Yeah. Well, Julie, first of all, thank you. I have loved being here. I love Julie and Julie, I've always loved Julie. So <laughs> um, I have a very, it's very easy. If you if you go to my website, which is my name, it's julierieseler.com and it's spelled out and spell it. It's 
J-U-L-I-E-R-E-I-S-L-E-R.com. Um, everything is, is there. I have a lot of, I have some really great free resources. I'm also on Insight Timer. If you look me up, I'm one of the course creators and teachers. I have a ton of free meditations and, and some courses and things like that. And then Instagram, Facebook, if you just look up my name, I try to keep it simple. Um, everything is under my name. So it's just easy. And uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit in there. <laughs> and your show. And my show, the USG podcast. Yeah, that is, oh my God, it's been, that was one of the intuitive guidances I got five years ago. I woke up and I heard, you need to start a uh, podcast. Now, I thought, I do not say no to that that guidance. So, okay, I have no idea how to do that. And then, you know, 350, 350 episodes later, here we are. So yes, the USG podcast, that's wherever you find your podcast or on YouTube. For sure. Terrific. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and share some of your wisdom and some of your stories of Phoenix rising out of from out of the ashes kind of stories and, and all of that. So everybody, I'll be back next week sending you lots of love Mwah! from Julie and Julie, Julie Squared. And uh, I'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.